Turn your Bible to Psalm 41 is where we'll be first. We'll be in various psalms and uh, several of the Gospels as well. So a couple different places, and I hope you will. As we go to these different places, turn with me there. The goal of the preacher is not to say his own words, but to draw our attention to Scripture. And so we want to do that this morning. Psalm 41 is the first place that we will be looking at. Well, since tomorrow is July 4th, our minds are drawn to the the birth of our nation, July 4th, 1776, and the events that surrounded that. And if you've done any uh, historical research or just enjoy the historical story, you know that the founding of our country, the, the war for American independence from Britain, is an incredible story. It's filled with military action, battles, strategy, inspiring heroes like George Washington and Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death, and Nathan Hale, my only regret is that I have but one life to lose for my country. But there was one person involved in that struggle for independence that really wasn't so inspiring for us. In fact, he is one of the most infamous traitors of all time. His name was Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold. A brilliant military leader, a brilliant military strategist, and actually in the early years of the war, he helped defeat the British in many battles, including a very pivotal battle, which some consider the turning point of the American War for Independence, the Battle of Saratoga in Saratoga, New York. But for Benedict Arnold, greed and distrust began to fester in him as he thought he was being mistreated, and he thought he was being passed over for promotion. In August of 1780, Benedict Arnold did gain control of the fort at West Point. But having become disenchanted with the American cause, he began to weaken his own troops, give away information about the positions of the American troops, and he began to put together a plan to surrender West Point to the British. Well, that plan was foiled when Major Andre, the man that uh, Benedict Arnold was in communication with, a British leader named Major John Andre, he was captured. And on him, letters were found from Benedict Arnold to the British that outed Benedict Arnold as a betrayer, as a traitor. Well, Arnold at that point, instead of facing the wrath of the colonial army, he defected and fought for the British. But when the British surrendered in 1781 at Yorktown, he fled to England. Surprisingly, Benedict Arnold did not find much success in the English military or in English business in England because for some reason, no one trusted him. Imagine that, right? Once a traitor, always a traitor. Benedict Arnold is a name that is synonymous with treachery and betrayal. I don't know too many parents that have named their kid Benedict Arnold something, right? It just doesn't happen. I also don't know many people that have named their child the name of Judas, who is also probably the greatest traitor in the history of the world. His story starts in Psalm 41, verse number 9. Say kind of a weird place to go? Yes, maybe. But I think the story of Judas starts here. And on several occasions, King David writes in the Psalms about close friends that betrayed him. We see one of those here in Psalm 41, verse 9. Would you look at it with me? David writes, Even my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. A familiar friend to David has gone against him and tried to harm him. Would you jump ahead to Psalm 55? Just a few pages forward, we see another few verses here where David talks about friends betraying him. Psalm 55, look at verses 12 to 15. David says, For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked to the house of God in the throng. What's David saying? He's saying, if it was an enemy that did me wrong, I'd kind of expect that 
in, in many ways, I would be able to handle it. It wouldn't be that big a deal. I'm expecting that. But he says it wasn't an enemy. It was a friend who betrayed him. And when a friend betrays you, that stings, doesn't it? Go to Psalm 109. We see another passage here where David actually gives us what he is praying for retribution for those who betray him. Psalm 109, it's really an extended section here, verses 6 to 20. Let's look at verses 6 to 13 here this morning and read these. David asking God for that this would be the retribution for those who would betray him. And I want you to see how direct and how harsh it is. Verse 6, David in essence saying to those who betray him, set a wicked man over him and let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him be found guilty, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. Let the creditor seize all that he has, and let the strangers plunder his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy to him nor let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off. And in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. David is direct and he is harsh in that. Now in these three Psalms, we see that David, as we've seen many times in the, in the previous weeks, David writes these Psalms out of his own personal experience. And I think it would be helpful to understand what we're getting to in the New Testament to be able to look back and say, okay, who were the people in David's life? Who were the close friends for David that betrayed him? Why does he write Psalm 41, 9, Psalm 55, Psalm 109? Who was it in David's life that betrayed him? Well, there are actually several to choose from. There's a lot of people that went back against David. The first one that comes to my mind is King Saul. King Saul to David, well, David, he, he was David's king. He was actually also David's father-in-law. He was the one who gave David his shot against Goliath. Remember, David goes to uh, King Saul. And he says, hey, I'll do it. And Saul gives him a shot. In fact, David had helped Saul and his kingdom repeatedly in securing their borders. And how is David repaid by King Saul? He tries to kill him. Talk about betrayal of someone that you would have higher hopes for as king and as your own father-in-law. Well, there's a few others as well that we could choose from. In 2 Samuel 15, we see the story of Absalom. Who's Absalom? Absalom is David's own son. And Absalom tries to gather the people to his side, trying to sway the people away from his father, betraying his own father and trying to rip the kingdom away from David as David during that time actually has to flee Jerusalem and Absalom is trying to set himself up as king in his father's place. That had to sting. We know it did from reading about David and what he said regarding this. Now, there's someone else also in that same story. In 2 Samuel 15, 31, we see a man by the name of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was one of David's counselors, a trusted counselor and advisor to David. But when Absalom tried to take the throne from David, Ahithophel, a counselor to David, actually flipped sides, went over to Absalom's side and became a counselor to Absalom. He betrayed David and took part in that mutiny. That may be, scholars think that when it says in Psalm 41, 9, that a familiar friend has betrayed me, they think that might be reference to Ahithophel spe specifically. And then the other one that comes to mind in David's life is Joab. In 1 Kings 1, verse 7, we see Joab's defection. Now, Joab for years had been David's military captain. And you read the stories of Joab, one of, one of David's mighty men, and he's just a man's man. He's brave. He's courageous. He is full-on Team David. But then at the very end of David's life, this, this, this guy named Adonijah rises up, and he tries to take the throne from David. David is old. The, the throne is about to be passed to Solomon. And guess who, though having been on Team David his entire life, his entire military career, at the very end, he flips. Joab did, and he went with Adonijah and tried to establish Adonijah 
as king. All these men, turncoats in their lives. Flipped sides, went back against David, but none of them, even the most notorious traitor of all time. Yet I think these that we see in the psalm help us. They help us. These ones that betrayed David, they help us to understand the greatest traitor of all time. Because when David writes, as we've seen many times, when David writes in the Psalms about these people that betrayed him and his feelings, his, what, what he went through with those, Jesus and then the New Testament authors also pick up on that. And they say what David wrote about the traitors in his life were also true, and they ascribe that to the writings of the apostles, the epistles, and the statements of Jesus. And for that story of Judas and Jesus, we go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Looking at verses 14 through 16, here we have the most famous traitor of all time. Matthew 26, verses 14, 15, and 16, it says, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. The most famous traitor of all time, Judas Iscariot. Well, who is Judas? We need to do a little bio on Judas. His name is a form of Judah, and it means Jehovah leads. Don't miss that. Jehovah leads is the meaning of his name, yet we know at the end of his life he was actually led by Satan. Yet also God uses him to accomplish the plan of redemption. Ironic, interesting in that regard. That's the first part of his name, Judas, but then you have this Iscariot. What is that? What does Iscariot mean? Well, Ish would be man. Cariot, meaning probably the town of Kerioth, Kerioth Hezron. So in other words, we're saying Judas, a man of Kerioth. So that's his, his birthplace, where he's from. Judas Iscariot. Now, Kerioth Hezron is in Judea, south of Jerusalem. He is the only disciple not from Galilee. And that maybe comes into play later on. Judas kind of the, the outsider, as it were, to the group. Now, Judas Iscariot is not to be confused with Jesus' brother named Judas. Judas was a common name back then. Jesus had a brother named Judas. There's also another disciple named Judas, just to throw everybody off, right? His, he was also called, this other disciple was called Lebius or Thaddeus. But we're not, when you see Judas mentioned in that way, it's not Judas Iscariot, it's Judas, the other disciple. Judas Iscariot comes along, and he's a little bit, as we read through Scripture, he's a little bit of an enigma. He's an unknown, all right? His dad's name, John 6, 71, his dad's name is Simon, which doesn't really help us out a whole lot because there was like everybody was named Simon in the Bible. And so we don't know anything else, though, about his family and his upbringing. We don't know what his occupation was. There's no record of his individual call to Christ like what we would have for Peter and Andrew and James and John and Nathaniel. We don't have that individual record of his call to follow Christ. He seemed, just like all the other disciples, as a common, ordinary guy who followed Christ. The first mention of Judas comes in three different places in just the list of the disciples that Jesus chose. Matthew 10.4, Mark 3.19, and Luke 6. 16. Yet there's something about Judas, as you go back and read the Gospels, you'll note every time his name is mentioned, he's associated with betraying Christ. His name will be mentioned in a list and it'll say, and Judas, the one who betrayed Christ. Or, and Judas, the betrayer. Every time his name is mentioned, he is associated with the betrayal of Christ. He is the ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing. And in Matthew chapter 26, Judas is nearing the end of about three years, probably two to three years of traveling with Jesus. And, and though he knows, though Judas knows Jesus personally, he has seen Jesus in action. He has experienced the blessings of Jesus. He still, Matthew 26, 14 to 16, he still goes to the Pharisees and strikes a deal with them 
to betray Jesus. You say, well, what was it? After two or three years of following Jesus, being called to follow Jesus, what is it that put Judas over the top? What made Judas go this far where he would be willing to betray Jesus? Well, I think the clue or maybe a clue to it is actually the passage right before Matthew 26, 14 to 16. We see this here in Matthew 26, 6 to 13. The same story is recorded for us in John 12, verses 1 to 8. And actually in John 12, we see a few more details as to the story. But what happens here, right before Judas goes to the chief priest to betray Jesus, what happens right before Jesus in, is in Bethany, we're at the house of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, his close friends. Mary comes, according to John chapter 12, verse 3, Mary anoints Jesus with a costly perfume. The Bible says it was worth about a year's wages. Imagine taking your year's wages and pouring them out and anointing Jesus. And when Mary did that, Judas couldn't take it. He said, how dare you allow that to happen? And here in Matthew 26 and in John 12, it's actually the only place that Judas speaks, only place recorded in scripture that Judas speaks before he goes and betrays Christ. And he calls out Mary. He calls out Jesus in essence. Why would you allow her to do this? To give this this oil, to use this oil to anoint you when it could have been sold and given to the poor. What a great guy Judas is, right? Looking out for the poor. Well, we learned several things about Judas from this story. And it's actually in John 12. That helps us out a little bit. If you want to turn there, you can. John 12 verse 6 tells us a little bit about Judas and what was going on in his mind. He says, when Mary pours this ointment out, he says in verse 5, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now look at verse 6. The Apostle John here in his writing gives us inside information about Judas. Something that the Apostle John did not know when this was happening. This is revealed to him by the Spirit of God later as he writes about what had happened. Verse 6, this Judas said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. So we learned some things about Judas here. He was the disciple's treasurer, in essence. He's the one that managed their funds. He had the money box, and he, from those funds, he pilfered, he stole he was greedy. And when Judas says, we should have sold this, this oil to the, should have sold the oil and given it to the poor. It's not because Judas cared for the poor, it says, it's because he was greedy. Think about it. Judas probably wanted that to be sold, the money to be put in his little box so they could give it to the poor. And in the meantime, what was he going to do? Get a little bit of kickback from it. That's probably his intention. You say, well, was this the event? Je Jesus rebukes him for it too. You see that in Matthew 26 and then also in John 12. Why do you trouble the woman? For he has done a good, she has done a good work for me. You say, okay, so this event that happens, Mary's oil, Jesus' rebuke to Judas, was that, was that the event that caused Judas to betray Jesus? Well, I guarantee it wasn't the only reason, but it may have been the final nail in the coffin, as we might say. Because I think Judas had played the part for several years. This was the last straw, as it were. But Judas had never been a true disciple. He was never truly in. He had followed Jesus for years with his feet, but had never followed Jesus with his heart. The greed and the resentment and the hostility towards Jesus that was probably simmering in Judas for years now boils over. It comes to the surface. And then Judas goes, probably slips out quietly after this event with Mary. They're in Bethany. They're only a couple miles from Jerusalem. Judas probably maybe under the cover of darkness, he slips out and he goes where? And he goes and finds the chief priests, the Pharisees, because that's what it tells us next here in verse 14. Then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests. Judas says, I've had it. Jesus is not giving me what I want. 
So I'm going to use Jesus to get what I want for myself. The question that Judas asks the chief priests gives us again insight into Judas. Look at the question that he asked them, verse 15. This is Matthew 26. What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? What are you willing to give me for Jesus? What can I get for Jesus? See, Jesus hadn't given Judas what he wanted. And so Judas says, I'm going to go get what I want for myself and use Jesus to do it. What will you give me for Jesus? As if Jesus is for sale. As if Judas has power over Jesus. As if you can put a value on Jesus. Well, it says there at the end of verse 15, they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. Don't miss this. When the chief priests and Judas agree on a price for Jesus, they show us what they think of Jesus. For that which has a price has a cap to its value. Don't miss that. What is truly valuable has no price, right? Because it cannot be sold. You will not sell it for anything. That's Jesus. Jesus has no price because Jesus is priceless in our lives. But that which has a price has a cap to its value. Now, you might be selling, you know, a piece of property or whatever, and you say, well, hey, it's worth a ton. But still, for the right price, you may sell it. That which has a price has a cap to its value. Jesus has no price in our lives. He is priceless. What value do you put on Jesus? What is Jesus worth to you? 30 pieces of silver? Is he worth living for Monday through Saturday, or is he worth just a couple hours on Sunday? How do we prove each day the worth and value of Jesus in our lives? What will you give me for Jesus? How much can I sell him for? To the chief priest and to Judas, he was only worth 30 pieces of silver. That's not just a random number, by the way. Exodus chapter 21, verse 32, tells us that that is the value of a common slave. Think about that. What did they think of Jesus? Zechariah 11, 12 to 13, tells us that this price was meant to be an insult to Jesus. You want to sell me Jesus? We'll show you what he's worth. Here, price of a common slave. Move along. It was meant to insult Jesus. But notice, in Judas's greed, he still took the money. For in Judas's estimation, even 30 pieces of silver was more than what Jesus had given him in life. What would you settle for if you could sell Jesus? That'll show you what he's worth to you. Or is he and your relationship with him absolutely priceless? There is nothing you would settle for. We pick up the story again in John chapter 13. Would you turn there, please? John chapter 13. Here in John chapter 13, Jesus reveals Judas as the betrayer. Jesus and his disciples are up in the upper room. We're talking hours before Jesus' death. This is, this is well into the Passion Week. And in John chapter 13, Jesus washes the disciples' feet, including Judas's. We pick it up in verse 12, having washed the disciples' feet. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Verse 18, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. 
He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Jesus washes the disciples' feet, commands them to serve as he has served. But then in verse 18, he makes an important distinction. He says, basically, someone in this room is not like the others. It's like those coloring book activities, right? You got a picture of all sorts of different sports balls and then a house. And it says, which one is not like the others? That's what he's saying here. There's one of you in this room that's not like the others. Someone in this room has a sinister plan. And in verse 18, Jesus quotes David, what we read earlier in Psalm 41, 9. He said, there's someone in this room, the, the, the one who has eaten bread with me, yet he has lifted up his heel against me. Remember what David said? Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And Jesus applies that scripture from David to himself that the scripture would be fulfilled. Look down at verse 21. Jesus gets even a little bit more blunt here. And he says, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you, one of you, the very one in this room, one of you will betray me. Then in verse 26, he gets even more direct. Verse 26, it says, Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. One of the disciples had asked Jesus, hey, tell us who the betrayer is. And Jesus says, whoever I give this bread to. And he dips the bread and he hands it to Judas. He gives the bread to Judas and Satan, it says, enters Judas at that moment. And Jesus tells him what you're going to do, do quickly. And Judas leaves, it tell us, tells us in verse 30, he leaves and probably heads straight for the chief priests. Jesus is very blunt. He says, this is the betrayer. And guess who misses it? All of the disciples entirely missed it. Not processing what Jesus is telling him. Had no clue that Judas is the betrayer. Verses 28 and 29, no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus has said to him, buy those things we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. Why did the disciples miss that Judas could possibly betray Christ? I think it's this reason. Judas had played the charade so well for so long that the disciples thought, no one in this room is capable of doing that. It must be something else he's talking about. See how good you can get at playing the game. You can fool yourself. You can fool everyone else. But guess what? Cannot fool Christ. Was he fooled? No, not whatsoever. In fact, John 6, 64, earlier in Jesus' ministry, in John 6, 64, Jesus said, he said, I, knew from, I know from the very beginning who will betray me. That's John 6, 64. He says, I know that one of you will betray me. And that brings up an important question that we kind of have to wrestle through. That's this. Since Jesus knew that Judas would betray him, why did Jesus call Judas to follow him? Right? Is that not something we have to think through? He knew from the beginning that it would be Judas that would betray him. So why mess with him? Why call him in the first place? And here I think we see a collision of divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Think through this with me. Did Judas betray Jesus out of his own hypocrisy and hatred? Yes. Was Judas's betrayal always a part of God's plan? Yes. Human responsibility, divine sovereignty. See, Judas's role as betrayer was foreordained by God long before, yet Judas also acts out of his own evil intentions. So God's plan and Judas's evil work in conjunction to accomplish the plan of salvation. And I think there's an important distinction to make, and I'm going to prove it here in Scripture in just a second. When Jesus chose Judas, he did not choose him for redemption like he chose the other disciples. He chose Judas to complete the plan of redemption. I'll say that once more. When Jesus chose Judas, he did not choose him for redemption like he chose the other disciples. 
He chose Judas in order to complete the plan of redemption. That comes from John 15, 16. We read it earlier in our scripture reading. In John 15, 16, Jesus says to the disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. What is fruit? It's the mark of a true believer, John 15, the whole first part of that passage. And Jesus says, I chose you disciples to go and to bear fruit. You say, well, Judas didn't bear fruit. He wasn't truly a disciple. I choose him. John 15 happens after John 13. Judas is no longer in the room. He's gone. When Jesus looks at these disciples, he says, you are the ones I've chosen to go and bear fruit. The betrayer has left. That's why John 13, verse 18, Jesus has already said, when Judas is in the room, I know whom I have chosen. I know whom I have chosen. You take that and you then go back and look at John chapter 6 and the beauty of that passage that all those that the Father gives to the Son will come to Christ, will, come to, will be saved in the end. It's beautiful. Jesus knows who he has chosen, he, he, and he knows why he has chosen them. And guess what? God and Jesus never once makes a mistake. That should be comforting for us, because sometimes you, you may not feel like you're saved, right? There may be some difficulty in our life, but God in Jesus never makes a mistake with those he has chosen. That applies to you, and that applies to me. He has not made a mistake with anyone. God's a good God. He's a God of grace. He's a God of goodness. And we pick up the story again, going back to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. This is the point at which Judas betrays Jesus in the garden. Matthew 26, looking at verses 46 down through 56. We're going to read 46 to 50. Jesus, having come out of the prayer there in the garden, garden of Gethsemane, verse 46, he says to his disciples, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the 12 with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. There is an incredible exchange here between Jesus and Judas. Brief, very brief, just a few short statements. But this incredible be Incredible exchange between Jesus and Judas as Judas betrays him. In verse 48, it says that Judas had already told those that were with him, you'll know who to get, you'll know who to seize. It'll be the one whom I kiss. In Luke twenty-two forty-eight, 48, Jesus in that moment actually says to Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? Think about that for a moment. What is a kiss? It's a sign of affection, devotion, of love. And yet to Judas, it is the sign of betrayal. What a reversal in Judas's mind of hatred for love. In verse 49, Judas says to Jesus, says immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. What is a rabbi? What's a rabbi, a Jewish teacher, teacher of the law? Was Judas right in call, calling Jesus a teacher? Absolutely. But don't miss the irony here. Judas calls Jesus teacher, and yet Judas had never learned what Jesus taught. Greetings, teacher. Never once having assimilated what Jesus had taught to him for years. Jesus, or excuse me, Judas was exposed to the greatest Bible teacher ever. He had more warnings. He had more teachings than anyone. And yet he never changed. He heard the gospel more than anyone else from the person of the gospel himself. And he never changed. 
Judas is the height of hypocrisy. That you can sit under all that Jesus did for years. You can listen to all that he taught and never once be stirred, never once repent, never once be motivated to serve. And I wonder, is that heart of hypocrisy in some of us? Sitting under the teaching of the word, we have become callous to it. Not because of the word, but because of us. Is the heart of hypocrisy of Judas in us? Have we lost our willingness to repent of sin and to turn to God daily? Judas heard the gospel all the time from the lips of Jesus himself, and nothing happened. He heard over and over that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He heard Jesus say, I'm heading to to die, and three days later, I will rise again. Judas was never stirred. Are we like Judas when we sit and stew under the teaching of the word instead of having our hearts stirred to be like Christ? My question is, how much of Judas is in us? In verse 50 in Matthew 26, Jesus said to him, don't miss this word, friend, why have you come? Friend. That takes us back to David, doesn't it? Psalm 41 and Psalm 55. When David said in Psalm 41, a familiar friend has raised up his heel against me. And then in Psalm 55, David had already said, if it was an enemy, I could handle it. But it's a friend. It's my acquaintance. It's the one that we had walked, we had walked together to the house of the Lord. It's tragic. The betrayal of Judas to a friend like Jesus. One last place we go to wrap up the story, and that's Acts chapter 1. Would you go there with me? Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends into heaven. The disciples under the leadership of Peter get together and we pick up in verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples altogether. The number of names was about 120 and said, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and and obtained a part in this ministry. Parenthetical here, verses 18 and 19. Now this man purchased a field, talking about Judas, with the wages of iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in their own language, Akadama, that is, field of blood. Now Peter picks up in verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. So Peter here is leading the disciples to replace Judas. Why did they have to replace Judas? Well, because of his betrayal, yes, but also because he's dead now. And that little parenthetical in verses 18 and 19 shows us what happens. Really, we see more more detail of that in Matthew 27, verses 3 to 10. See, Judas, once he had betrayed Christ, he runs back to the chief priest. He he knew he had messed up. Now, it wasn't true repentance. It was remorse that things didn't turn out like they thought it would. He thought things were going to turn out a little differently. They didn't turn out like he thought it should. Be reminded, that's a lesson there. When you turn your back on Christ and go after sin in the world, it will never turn out like you thought it would. Never. Judas goes to the chief priests. He says, I have betrayed innocent blood, and they basically blow him off. (laughs) What's that to us? And so he throws the 30 pieces of silver down on the temple floor, and he goes to a field, and he hangs himself. Talk about Judas, a life with so much promise, a life lived so close to Christ, but in the end, it was a life ruined by sin. Be careful. It has been said of Judas 
that he kissed the door of heaven and went to hell. Be careful. Be cautious. Don't turn your back on Jesus. In verse 20 here in Acts chapter 1, Peter quotes two Psalms of David. They give the prophecy, give us the reason for why Judas must be replaced. The first one that he quotes there, it says, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. That's a direct quote from Psalm 69, verse 25. We didn't look at that one earlier, but Psalm 69, 25 says those exact words. That's harsh. It's basically saying, the one who betrayed Jesus, let him die. He's not worthy to live. Where he used to live, let no one live there anymore. Then the second part here in verse 20, Peter here quotes Psalm 109.8, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. It says, let another take his office. We saw that already in Psalm 109.8. It said, let his days be few and let another take his office. What's interesting here is what office is in mind? What does it mean? You know, the corner office downtown that Judas had, what, what's in mind here? Well, as an apostle, Judas would have had a position of leadership in the early church. He would have had that position going forward then in the first century church. Jesus being off the earth now and the, the, the early church starting, Judas would have had that. But now someone else has to rise up and take his place. And that's what Peter's talking about here. In the early stages of the church, who would rise up and take the place of Judas? They needed a faithful man, one who had proven himself faithful to Christ. I think in this we also see the grace of God that Judas was only around when Jesus was around. Jesus did not allow Judas to undermine the early church. Judas was moved out of the way. Can you imagine what it was like if Judas tried to stick around and undermine the early church? Jesus said, no, his time's done. He didn't allow the early church to suffer through Judas specifically. And then in verse 26 of, of Acts chapter 1, we see Matthias is chosen. Matthias, we don't really have much about him in Scripture any other place, really. Matthias was an ordinary man with extraordinary faith, chosen to replace an ordinary man who became an extraordinary villain. An ordinary man raised up to replace the greatest traitor of all time. We started off this morning talking about American history, and in 1865, there's another Amer famous American traitor who said his last words. After killing Abraham Lincoln, John Wilkes Booth fled south from D.C. into northern Virginia, eventually hiding out in a barn on the Garrett Farm. After being discovered there in that barn, the troops surrounded the barn, and they eventually set fire to it. And in that fire, in the chaos and confusion, John Wilkes Booth was shot in the neck. He was then dragged out of that fire, and he was taken to the porch of the Garrett farmhouse. And there, John Wilkes Booth uttered his last words. And they were two words, the same word. He said, useless, useless. As John Wilkes Booth lay dying, he realized that his efforts and maybe even his life had proved useless. See, he did not die a revered man, did not die a rich man or a hero. He died a hated man. And I think there's a similarity there between him and, and Judas. Judas dying, going out and hanging himself, he died realizing that what he had done did not satisfy him. It did not win the acclaim that he thought it would. Instead, for Judas in the end, it was useless. Useless. That should be a sobering thought for us. Be careful that you do not turn your back on Christ. It will be useless.